from that, say, 60% up to the target 80% um, on the replacement value. So this is a lot of information and data, but the, the, like I said, the takeaway is to talk about what are the kinds of things you could do to get this huge adjustment in cost, because the target was to take it from, say, roughly 36 percent of salaries down to 23 percent. It was a self-imposed target on their part, so there was no magic to that, but it was to say if you take, if you're trying to get a very large financial impact, what are the, what are the steps that could get you there? And you can move one or the other, but, but that's the kind of volume you're talking about in terms of adjustment uh, to your costs. So the defined contribution plan would be a new element. Clearly, we've been 100 percent defined benefit. And uh, there was a great deal of discussion at, at least two or three of the meetings about the efficiency of those plans, whether or not, as Pete talked about, some of the cons and how you might mitigate those when an employee would be relying on that to replace a defined, uh, something that used to be part of a defined benefit plan. And so a lot of the talk uh, was around, well, what if the state administered it? Um, so the actuary gave us sort of three scenarios, oh, I should say the advisory group, talked about different scenarios where the administration were somewhat state, state handled through completely uh, outsourced. So um, this slide kind of takes you through those options. So if you're 100 percent state administered, the state would take the responsibility for administering the investment of the individual plans. Um, some of the cons with that that were presented to the group was that the, there's limited resources and expertise on, that the state currently has to do that for uh, employees. Um, there could be a, a piece of that that they outsource where they take the administration and outsource that and then manage the individual accounts with different parameters, not, not a complete uh, control over it, but maybe some parameters. And the other option is they completely take it out of the state's hands, allow an outside group to administer it and manage the investment, and the state really just sort of lets it um, run from another group and is much less involved in the management of the employee's money. Um, there was a lot of different ideas about, you know, what would produce the, uh, the right outcome and, um, I wouldn't say there was any consensus on that. Certainly a lot of questions. Um, one of the main principles of the group's um, charge, as Pete talked about in the beginning, was that um, this problem should not occur again and there should be components within any new plan that allow for what's called self-correcting. So is there a way to press a lever when funding goes down. Um, you saw it in one of the scenarios where your COLA is determined by investment earnings, or you don't get a COLA if you don't hit a certain funding level. That would be uh, a self-correcting concept. So um, there's also consideration for, uh, there was some discussion about, well, could you alter the employee contribution if there was a certain funding level? Um, I don't think they, the, the, con the concept was simply that you didn't leave it to an annual consideration of the retirement board or for the assembly to have to act in a time of crisis, that, that the system would sort of fix itself as you went along and you never got to a crisis situation. Uh, so you see in, in the scenario that the actuary provided elements of that, but they could be any different kind of elements. And then as you look at it, well, do you set it at 75 percent? Do you, you know, do you, do you, um, do you earmark, do you benchmark the uh, investment earnings at a higher or a lower rate? I mean, there's endless options for that. Um, but that was a key element that, um, the, that the group kept coming back to. There was components of, e of two or three meetings that talked about the municipal issues. We spent a couple hours with you last week going through um, municipal pension issues. The, I showed you a slide on the MERS. Uh, those are the ones that are in state statute. Um, the discussion of the independent plans. 
with a couple of presentations from some of the advisory group members um, concerned about the impact on the locals. Uh, you recall that there's uh, over a $2 billion liability and, and a roughly 40% funded ratio, according to the Auditor General's report. Uh, so it's a fairly large issue out there for the locals as well. Not unlike the state, at least the MERS side, the issue of, and, and the teachers, I should say, the participation in Social Security is a major issue uh, for the municipals. Again, you then have the complexity of the administration of the plans and the benefits. You have what you don't have in the MERS or the state is the variance in plan design, um, how disability pensions are handled. Uh, something we talked about last week as well is that the option for second careers after retiring and whether membership in different systems is allowed and the, the variance on the local side to, to be able to pay some of these bills and the fact that some of the, some of the plans are very well funded and, and many are not. So the board, I mean the, um, the advisory group kind of struggled with, you know, how do you attack a, a, a problem that has all of these issues. Um, but there were some ideas thrown out there. Um, and they included uh, an option to move local plans into MERS, something you've heard about before. Um, again, an option to say that benefits should change until you reach certain target uh, funding levels. Should there be benefit limits placed on the locals? Um, are there features of a local plan that should be um, eliminated or not allowed? For some of the really poorly funded plans, is there an option to buy out the, the potential retirees? And, and finally, one of the uh, recommendations from the presenters was that there should be some audits on the non-MERS plans. The advisory group also discussed a number of other pension issues, not as in-depth, I'd have to say, as, um, as some of the, the big levers that we already talked about. But vesting, you, you heard me mention in one of the scenarios that Vesting is 10 years, but in the new scenarios, it's five years. Not a lot of discussion on disability pensions, but some talk about that would have to be part of the mix as well. Um, there was a um, notion of service credit purchases. Should those be limited? You probably recall that your 2009 changes required that all of them be done on an actuarial basis, so there wasn't a great deal of discussion on this particular issue. Um, but one of the ideas was to limit it only to military service. There was a question about whether part-time work should be allowed to be counted towards years of service. And then there was some discussion about um, how you would treat low-income earners, which has been one of the concerns um, in the past when you talk about um, defined contribution plans and the impact on the lower-income folks. Uh, so there was some discussion on that. Um, finally, there were a number of issues that did not get a great deal of discussion. As, as we mentioned, it was four meetings. They were a couple hours, three hours long each and well attended, but there, were a lot of, there was a lot of ground to cover. But there are some, some issues out there that are most likely of interest to you and um, would probably need some attention as well. And that is how would one transition from the current plan to a new plan, particularly for long-term employees who aren't eligible to retire? Um, what would the impact be on the current work, workforce? Um, there's other aspects of the, um, of the benefit provisions. Um, what those who are, um, oh, as far as the transition goes, um, current age and years of service, how might you transition them to, the new, to a new plan? Um, Additionally, one thing that we don't talk a lot about in the state employees plan, there's actually a couple of subsets for nurses uh, employed by the state hospital and for correctional officers that have a, a different standard. And when you made changes in the 2009 session, you made um, comparable but different changes to those groups. That didn't get a lot of discussion, obviously, like I talked about before, the, the idea was to simplify it by talking only about state employees. There was li a little mention of the state police and judges, um, but you didn't, we didn't see any scenarios on that. There was just some discussion on it. Um, but So there were a number of things that, that clearly didn't get tackled, um, at least not in the meetings, that, that you would 
you would have to worry about. Thank you very much, Sharon, Peter. Um, outstanding work once again. Uh, I certainly hope that the members of the finance committees found these briefings to be helpful as we um, approach the task ahead of us of uh, pensions. I'd like to turn the meeting over now to the Senate Finance Chairman, Senator Daniel DuPont, for any questions or comments or uh, discussion amongst committee members. Um, I just had um, not just a question, but maybe a request. Could you just, I don't know if there's, if it's been just a lack of, of information or, um, you know, just a, a lack of education or knowledge on what some of, what the defined contribution piece of a hybrid plan can actually look like. I think, you know, for most of us that have heard uh, the horror stories of what have, what's happened to uh, private sector 401k plans in a, in a down market, can you talk a little bit about how uh, plans can be designed, what, you know, restrictions can be placed on the def a defined contribution portion of um, retirement plan? Certainly. Um, should you go down the path of looking at defined contribution plans, there are opportunities to make it as flexible or fairly inflexible in terms of what kind of investments can be made. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the parameters you're thinking, in terms of you could have it where they have a wide breadth of types of investments ranging in the relative risk of those dollars. Or you can determine for the employer a much narrower kind of menu of options in terms of what they can and can't invest those dollars in. Um, you can also restrict the use of those dollars in terms of traditional 401ks in the private sector tended to be pretty liberal in terms of being able to borrow against them, to withdraw dollars early. And one of the concerns about defined contribution plans was this leakage concept. If you allow employees to use it for other resources or other reasons, it imp impedes their ability to have those resources when they are ready to retire. And you, ha you are in a position that you can define those parameters in law. And how narrow you make it, you know, obviously gives you some flexibility in terms of how narrow or wide you want to make those options. But you do have that ability to address that in law um, when you are drafting and designing this program. And uh, just one other question. With respect to the, um, there was a slide on public safety in MERS. Um, at least for the state employees and teachers, all of the pension benefits are stipulated in statute. For the MERS, maybe MERS as a whole, not just uh, public safety, but how much of it is statutory or um, ordinance in, in the local governments and how much of it is um, contractual? And is did the advisory group talk about what potential problems there could be if you want to change MERS uh, with respect to public safety and what contractual <laughs> impediments there may or may not be? Well, MERS is like the state and teachers in that the benefit is defined in statute. It is not in the collective bargaining contracts. The independent, um, the non-MERS, as we've called them, the independent retirement plans are the ones that are likely contained in collective bargaining contracts. So there was some discussion about clearly the difference in terms of what might be in a contract and what might not be. Um, and that, di that distinction was made in, in terms of non-MERS and MERS, but not necessarily any other really big discussion on that. I think you, you probably both saw in the, the briefing from the treasurer that the, that the legal implications on the contract one um, was a concern they had raised, uh, but there wasn't a, wasn't a big discussion on, on that. It was more about the size of the problem, I'd have to say. <laughs> but clearly the MERS is statutory, and, and, and that was something they were looking at. Any uh, questions from the committee? Senator Cohen. Thank you, uh, Chairman DuPont. 
I have uh, several that go through the presentation, uh, but they're, they're quite easy. One is the average number of employees that retire on an annual basis, discounting the uh, Kachiri era here, if we have a number of that. That was one. Two, I, I, I assume all of us have been receiving uh, emails and letters, and I, I received one, and this is something that should be asked to our, uh, our great actuaries there. Uh, there's a lady that purchased time uh, under the full actuarial value. Uh, she's finishing up paying $109,000. I believe she's in her last year, she said, of paying it. Based on her paying this, she entered into an agreement that if I pay X for these amount of years, I'm going to get Y. What is the liability factor that we have with that individual? And how many more are like that? Uh, I mentioned the, the effect of the income tax, the loss of revenue there, and, and what that number would be. And the last one is, uh, I know you said you're going to. There's something that would trigger and protect the lower pensioner. Uh, at what rate would that be to protect these individuals from tapping into our social service programs? Obviously, we're not a company that once they retire, they're done with them. We pick them up one way or another, either on the front end or the back end. So, how are we going to protect the escalating cost on the back end here? Senator, I can certainly um, at least react to two of the comments that you made and try and, we'll try and find the information for the others. Um, for the last point about the discussion from the advisory group as to whether or not a provision or some kind of partial part of the design to protect the low, lower wage earners that would be looking for retirement when they reach eligibility, um, there really wasn't anything that they settled on in terms of a solution to that question. It was more of raising it and recognizing the issue and there hadn't been a model that was easily applicable to what they were exploring. Um, so I don't know um, what that mechanism might be. Um, the larger concern was is that the DC plan um, could have an adverse, that component of it could adversely affect the low wage earner who is looking to retire um, because of the nature of just the, the, the volume of dollars that they may not have accessible to. Um, the other question that you asked earlier, and I, th I think as part of the advisory group in discussing how this would go forward, the transition concept that we talked about earlier, um, is the concept if you've already earned accrued benefits, um, it was at least my impression that the advisory group understood that you would keep those accrued benefits. And this might affect your future benefits and what you accrue in the future, but if you've already accrued time and you've accrued it under a certain um, benefit structure, that going forward at a certain date, depending on how this may or may not be structured, your accrual rate may change going forward, but it wouldn't affect what you've already earned. Um, as to the income tax information, we will see if we can track that down for you to give you a flavor for what that might be as in terms of a fiscal impact. And um, I believe we probably can get you near term the average number of employees that retire annually. It will vary obviously by, by type of program, but we but do I have that. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be the 2,500 that we've seen in the last couple of years. That made the spike up to where it is. Right. And I, I think one of, one of the principles, even though it wasn't outlined directly, um, the advisory group did talk about um, the concept of making sure you don't accidentally encourage or push your talent out because you certainly need that to make sure that we're providing high quality services and there's quite a number of excellent public employees who are delivering those services and you want to make sure you retain them. Peter, I Going back to the, uh, I think your second answer, the one about they would re retain their uh, accrued credits, I wasn't concerned about that because I was pretty sure they would. My concern was the agreement, as you know, when you go into the pension fund office and they pull everything out, you're, you're going back and forth and you have a determination at that point to uh, whether or not you want to purchase these years at the actual value and then they basically tell you what you're going to earn and where you're going to go. Knowing that this lady, based on what she was told she would be earning in the future, made the determination to purchase that time, now there could be a change. Uh, uh, I know 
well, some of us in here are on attorneys, but what legal obligation would we have it under that? 